My name is Greg Richter. I'm here as a, I would call it a survivor of a family member overdosing and dying. And I want to, I want people to get the message and understand drugs kill. Tim growing up, grew up in a, we're a really, for the most part, the family's religious. We've got seven Southern Baptist ministers. Um, we've got law enforcement. We've got a few of those that did wander into the criminal element. Um, I've been in law enforcement for 20 years, both overseas and locally. My dad's been in law enforcement 20 plus years. My brother started, like I said, he started with alcohol. And he, while he consumed a little bit, he wasn't a hard drinker. Um, he moved into Xanax, I believe was his first drug that he tried. And then Xanax wasn't really cutting it unless he did a large amount of Xanax. And he started out with just taking the pills, but progressively he wasn't a needle intravenous user. He was scared of needles, but he snorted the quick, the quick high of getting it in straight into the bloodstream from the nose. And he started snorting. He crushes Xanax, then he moved on to Vicodin, Oxymorphone, Oxycodone. Oxycontin was a little bit hard for him to get, so Oxycodone, Xanax, Vicodin, and Oxymorphone were his, his drug of choice What he started getting into real heavy. When he's sober, when he's off of dope, alcohol, the kid's a genius. Um, he was really good. He took his talent and smarts using uh, the computers and stuff and was able to access my parents' re dad's retirement fund, was able to start stealing money that way. He would walk around the electronics in the house would disappear. Mom would be like, Timmy, go get, go get the Wii back. He'd take the Wii down to the local pawn shop. There was the alcohol, but it just seemed like there was something a little bit more. But at the time I didn't put two and two together. I'm, I was a cop. You, <laughs> your brother don't do drugs wrong. When I left law enforcement locally to go overseas and he was, we'd gotten him a job working in uh, where I had worked off duty. Uh, I won't use the name, but it was a good place. I had a great boss um, and he gave him a chance. We had a good family name and I put it behind it. Uh, he won't do nothing stupid. And he started falling asleep a lot. You're carrying a gun in security, you can't fall asleep. I would get call after call, hey, something ain't right with Timmy. And I, I thought, okay, he maybe dabbled in pills. And again, pills at the time, seven, eight years ago, weren't big. They were on the, the, the verge of going big, but they weren't there yet. And call after call after call. Hey man, something ain't right with your brother. And when I'd ask him, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm just tired, I'm really tired, I'm working two, three jobs. I'm like, eh. Well, I flew overseas. He, uh, I got a call. Hey, <laughs> your brother's in a bad way. And that's where I started figuring out. It wasn't just a little problem. It was huge. <laughs> Little I know how big it was going to get. And it actually didn't start with the pills. It started with alcohol. And then uh, when the alcohol was masking some of the things for him, it became somebody gave him a pill. He's like, oh, okay, well, pill mixing with alcohol worked. And then he started finding out, hey, wait a minute, I can do a few more pills. Okay, well, that's, I'm kind of build a tolerance up. Let me do a few more pills. And I knew, okay, this is steadily going downhill faster than I thought. And I was on the verge of coming back from Afghanistan where I was a law enforcement professional over there. Um, and I can give you another date that I can remember vividly where we intervened. And it was a intervention 
with several family members and a close friend of the family. Um, July 21st, my birthday. I had a small get together at my house and uh, hadn't seen my brother in a couple months, probably a, about almost six, good six months. He came into my house where we were sitting there and all talking, kind of hanging out and talking. And he didn't look like him. No weight, face, just, he looked like a crackhead. It was the, that's a nice way to put it. There's things where people do interventions and you see them on television, but I can tell you right now, it's one thing on television, a whole nother in a person. Mom, dad, me, close family friend, my sister. It was a lot of him denying and lying right at first. Some probably more, I would say, muscled conversation was had with me and my brother with my parents taken out of the room because I figured maybe he didn't want to disappoint dad, disappoint mom. And that's when I was able to find out that he stole several thousands, not a thousand, several thousands of dollars. He had pawned God knows what, a lot of gun, property, his property, my sister's property, my parents' property. And after a long, lengthy conversation that went from probably midnight to well in, four or five o'clock in the morning, he uh, got thrown out of the house. That was it. I had to help my parents understand, it's done. He stole money from you. You stole a lot of money. You stole your retirement. And if you don't do anything now, you're going to be burying him later. I can tell you right now, I wish we'd have, just, we'd have shoved him into rehab faster. I, it could have made a difference, maybe not, I don't know. And he finally found rock bottom. He caught, it came back to mom and said, I'm it, I'm done. And she's like, well, convince your brother. I'm like, Timmy, it's it. There's nothing left, brother. It's, <laughs> it's either the all or nothing. You pick. And he chose to get help. He uh, went to Chicago, went to an inpatient. And it was, as most, I guess you can call it, most of your rehab centers are voluntary because if they don't want it, they're not going to accept it. He went to Chicago somewhere he's not familiar with the cops, not familiar with the layout, not familiar with all the, the, the big city things as opposed to here. Um, and got help. At one point, the conversation was had while he was in rehab, if he'd ever tried crack. I was curious. I was like, what have you tried? He had, believe it or not, not dibbled or dabbled in heroin, but he did smoke crack once or twice. He wanted to see what it was. And he wanted to stay awake because the pills he was doing, he was doing oxymorphone, oxycodone, uh, Vicodin, Xanax. He, what he could get his hands on. Um which a couple of those would later be his demise with some, some additional things. For three, four years, he was straight. He was, man, he was, it was awesome. I reconnected uh, probably when I went back to Afghanistan, 2016, 17. And we, we chatted back and forth. Um, and he met a couple of ladies along the way and he met his future fiance, who was just awesome. Rocked his world. Didn't think a chick could rock his world. She opened him back up, put color in his life. They just, they, everywhere they were, there's a, a glow about him. And it was a glow that hadn't been there. Even the glow didn't exist, I don't think, with the fake relationship he had with the, the young lady that did introduce him to the dope. It was just a, a different glow. There was a confidence. Um, and for the first time, you could see him happy. You just, he had weight on him, which, you hadn't seen him with weight, which was, un I mean, when you start to get a belly and he never had a belly because he was always skinny or when he was on dope, he was skinnier. He was happy. Had an awesome relationship. Really good truck driving job. Probably reconnected with all of our family. Me and him started talking on a regular basis. Every time I talk to him, I'm proud of you. You're good, right? Yeah, I'm proud of you. You're doing good. He 
he, he did well. He did well for three, four years. There was an awesome glow about him. And then at a certain point, uh, Avery, his daughter, He goes, before he put out the big social media thing, hey, I'm, uh, we're, we're pregnant. We're going to have a girl, have a baby at the time. He hit me up on Facebook Messenger. was like, hey, got something to tell you. It's like, oh, God. At this time, I'm, I'm, I'm at a 50-50 mind of uh, maybe he got back into the world. He didn't. He goes, look, she's, she's pregnant. I'm like, oh, boy. But, man, I've never seen another. It was like another glow. Happy. I think when he did find out he was pregnant, it was he was happy. But at the same time, it was, oh, man, now I've got another human being I'm responsible for. And I told him, I was like, bro, it's I've got three. I'm going to tell you right now, it's a responsibility beyond all responsibilities. And it's, but it's also got the joys you're getting ready to enter a crazy world. So don't, if you if you feel like you, you're you gonna maybe bounce back to that other world, reach out to me. Let me know what's going on. Because I know the stressors are key things that will trigger some of the events to, to start going that direction. Things were going a little bit rocky at the time and I didn't know it until later on. Because I guess with the baby being born, being colicky, of course, uh, things with the fiance, they were, they were good, but it's stressful. You have a newborn. And uh, some of those stressors started to kick in on, on, on them again. And I, I just, that's where I should have known that some of the things I maybe should have been a little bit more observant, paid attention a little bit more to the communications that started to now degrade. Well, Tim told me he was a recovering addict like the day after our first date to Disney. And I'm pretty sure the only reason why he told me was because he didn't want me to hear from anybody else. And the way he made it seem was that he was sober for like three to four years and that he'd been sober for a really long time. And, um, you know, he had it all under control. Tim um, was, and I hate to say this, he was a master manipulator. He would pit um, me against his mom and me against his family. Um, so that way there would be no communication. He was very manipulative. Um, of course, he was my baby. I waited 14 years for him, and we were very close. We talked a lot. I talked to him every day. And he didn't want his brother to know what was going on. He didn't want him to know that he was struggling. I'd come into his room, and he's laid out like, like that. One night he'd come in, I heard him struggling with breathing. I grabbed a hold of him, yanked him up, shook him, walked him around, tried to fill him with coffee, just kept him walking around. Having been in law enforcement and my, my other son, Greg, having been in law enforcement, the crazy thing is, I think Greg recognized it and I did. I was up on it all the time. It can touch anybody. Alcohol can be an addiction. Drugs can be an addiction. Anything that's used to access is an addiction. You gotta be able to recognize the addiction first in somebody else or yourself. I gave him a hug, and this was the day before he passed. And the crazy thing was, I, I 
kind of knew what was going on. And my prayer was, Lord, relieve his pain. Little did I know the next morning, he'd be dead. So he started texting me later at night and finally, because I was so exhausted, mentally, physically, and emotionally from trying to lift him up and keep him going, not let him know about the money, worrying about Andrew and the baby, worrying about Greg was coming home in a couple weeks, what was gonna happen. And I just said to him, it was about 11.30, I said, Tim, I gotta go to bed. I said, I, I can't do, I, I said, you gotta just ask the Lord to help you and he'll He'll be there for you. I said, just, just keep on going, you cannot give up. And he just said, I love you, mom. And that was the last text I caught from him. I noticed the first sign was the lights were on in the room. And that was really abnormal because he likes to sleep in pitch black and it's completely dark. So I thought maybe he just passed out. And I thought maybe he was using again um, and he fell asleep with the lights on. And when I walked in the room, he wasn't on the bed. Um, and when I walked in, he was sitting on the floor with his face in the carpet. And I tried to like nudge him. I was like, hey, it's not funny. Like, wake up. Like, we got to give Avery a bath. And I tried to pull him up and his face was completely black. I just, I would want him to know of all the people that would feel his loss. If, I mean, if that were to happen. Because he didn't think people loved him. And I think if he knew, if he really knew, I think he would have tried harder. Timmy wasn't somebody that was always in a suit and tie. Anybody that knows Timmy was a flow grown t shirt. I think he owned every flow grown t shirt they had ever made, a pair of jeans or a pair of shorts, and flip flops. And I just, man, picking his clothes out, figuring out what he's going to do, what he's going to wear, how he's going to look. It's like, okay, well, I went outside to take a breather. I was outside talking on the phone, and in comes a van. I'm not dumb. I know what's in that van. The funeral director had already kind of been at odds at letting me see him when he came in. So I, I'm like, I've seen bodies from here to Haiti to Afghanistan. It ain't, ain't going to be a different... It, it, he's family, but I want to see him. They brought him in, opened up the uh, bag. <sighs> he looked like Tim, a little bloody. Of course, I could see where they'd done an autopsy on him. But it looked like him. Zipping that bag up was my closure. And then the day of the funeral. Longest, hardest day of my life. Like I said, never thought I'd be buried my brother, 29 years old. June 2nd, forever, will be a day that sticks with me. One of the things, the conversations, and it should have been a trigger that I should have caught in conversation. I don't have any friends. Yeah, you do. You got friends, man. The day of his funeral, I've never seen that church in 20, 20 years have every seat just about filled in the pew all the way to the back of the church. I even said it in the eulogy. I'm like, you said you have friends. Bro, you got a whole church full. You got me in church after God knows how many years. You have friends. You have friends. It's the ripple effect of something real. Man, I never thought I'd be the one going, give him a chance. 
Look past it. Give them a chance. Reach a hand out. Find them something that can help them with the dope, man. It's a it's a bad drug. Fentanyl's bad. Heroin's bad. Pills, you think they can't get them? They can get them. They can get them from anybody and everybody. Toxicologies came back. Wow. Oxycodone, lethal amounts. Oxymorphone, lethal amounts. Fentanyl. 68 micrograms, which is beyond lethal. It's enough to kill a small army. I think my dad was shocked and disappointed being that he's been in law enforcement. He's been at the jail and booking. Not my kid. This doesn't happen to my kid. I know all the signs. We know all the signs. We we know what to look for. And, and I also think it was just how... How did it happen? Where did I not give them the tools to deal? You could be a tough, you could be tough, you could still care. Communication is key. Give them, give them hope. You gotta give them hope, because if you don't give them hope, it's just gonna keep going into the ground. And they're gonna feel that they have no nobody to reach to. If you got kids that affect your kids, they don't get to grow up with a mom or a dad. It affects your brothers, your sisters. If they got, it just it affects your family. Think about the after effects when you're not here, the financial obligations, man, that's nothing. But that time, time is endless, time is priceless. The time they don't get to spend with you. Think about that. If that gives you that one little percent of hope, grab onto it. Somebody's there to help you. Reach out to somebody. Don't, don't wait until you're in the ground, until you got a marker, putting an end to end date, an expiration date, because you're somebody. You're worth saving. You're a human being. So just reach out. If I could talk to him again, I just wish you to talk to me more. Tell me, hey, the baby's stressing me. Hey, I've got that that itch again. What do I do? Help me. Man, money was good in Afghanistan, but I'd have dropped. All the money in the world I was making. Damn, my brother. Here today. I'd have come home. In a heartbeat. And if it meant sitting with him somewhere. Letting him get sick. Getting him straight again. I'd have done it. I'd have dropped everything I had. Just to have his life. I'd give mine in exchange for his. Just so he could live. My name is Drew Brzezinski. I am founder and director of clinical outreach for Beachside Recovery Interventions and Consulting. And I'm a primary therapist for Florida Counseling Centers in Melbourne, Florida. Primarily got into this field um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is kind of my own challenges in the past with uh, substance use, uh, behavioral um, kind of mental health challenges, a lot of depression and anxiety. Um, but ultimately, apart from that, um, Brevard County Local, who lost about 30 friends either to opiate use disorder, um, drunk driving, or uh, suicide. 
Got about three DUIs uh, here in Brevard County, um, multiple other interactions with the law, and uh, which ultimately kind of led to, you know, started out just very short stints in county jail. A um, couple nights here, a couple nights there, getting bonded out um, until ultimately I actually backed into a car drunk and got hit with an aggravated assault charge um, due to being intoxicated behind the wheel. All my friends that I had lost, all the needles I pulled out of friends' arms and um, friends I saw, you know, intentionally take their own lives, which is kind of a lot on the shoulders. Um, and during that last DUI, I really kind of just faced that fork in the road where I was looking at a significant amount of, of time in prison. So I was out, uh, I was out surfing one day and I was thinking about ultimately what is it that I want in life? What is it that I want to do? What is it that I want to be? What are the most important things? What are the most important goals? Um, and growing up without a father and a sick mother that those goals were to be a good husband and a good father someday. And I basically knew that if I stayed on the track that I was on, um, I was not going to be able to accomplish those goals because I truly didn't believe and don't believe that I was an alcoholic, right? I didn't believe I was a drug addict. I would use cocaine when I drank, um, never really experimented too much outside of that, but ultimately just became a completely different person. And I drank to numb my emotions. I drank to cope with trauma. I drank to cope with depression, shame, guilt, family stuff, the loss of my mother when she passed away when I was younger, not having a dad around. That day served and made a decision to uh, call my attorney and help him get me into a treatment center in Ocala. That was about a year long program. Um, when I went there, I really focused on my mental health in treatment, he's, you know, he used the word alcoholic. And I said, don't, I'm not an alcoholic. And he said, well, what are you here for? You have multiple DUIs. <laughs> and uh, I said, man, I have trauma. I have lost, I, I hate myself, you know, I'm depressed. And uh, he worked with me from that perspective. And I worked on the trauma and I worked on the depression and I worked on the anxiety. And for me, and this is my story, um, everything else kind of just, dissipated and went away when I worked through that. I started going to school at a local community college. I was still doing probation at the time, um, so I was still under the care of the state. While I was going to school, um, I, I had completed treatment. I moved to Ocala, and while I was going to school, I actually uh, caught a technical violation of probation for being out of the county with permi without permission. Um, at which time they sentenced me to a year and a day in the Florida Department of Corrections. So I um, went up the road to prison and did nine and a half months on a year and a day, which was probably the most sobering experience that I've ever encountered in my life. Um, went to solitary confinement while I was there, closed management, um, spent 45 days um, in closed management and basically I've always been a Christian, but found God again <laughs> and um, really just committed to myself that, you know, even though I had done the work up until that point, I still had more work to do. You know, utilizing my story um, to help others, you know, kind of deconstruct their own narrative and, and uh, rewrite their stories. Um, for me, in my experience, in what I've seen with my patients in the six years working in the fields, it all stems back to trauma and mental health. Oftentimes, oftentimes, um, substance use, addiction um, is a symptom of something greater. So that trauma, um, that abandonment, um, you know, that depression, that anxiety, those personality traits that um, kind of turn into behavioral issues if not addressed through clinical therapeutic techniques. I definitely think addicts are able to be rehabilitated. The first thing I would say is I try to destigmatize mental health and addiction as much as possible, um, which would really start by the way we address addiction and the way we address individuals struggling with substance use disorders. So me personally, in the way the field's moving is I try to get away from 
the word addict, right? Because it kind of puts people in a box or from personality disorder, right? Because that's again, stigmatizing puts people in a box. So um, I do believe that people struggling with substance use disorders, whether it be alcohol use disorder, you know, OB use disorder, stimulant use disorder. Um, yes, I absolutely believe in rehabilitation and rehabilitation is primarily focused around working on what is that intrinsic, that internal motivation for change. You know, why do you want to live? You know, and once you can establish with a patient why they want to live and why they want to fight and what they want to do with their life um, and what their goals are, then you can start to work from the pre-contemplation stage of change into the contemplation stage of change and the action stage of change to help your loved one understand that they are worth more and they deserve more and that reaching out for help isn't a sign of weakness. It's actually conversely a sign of strength. One of the things I often hear from family members um, or loved ones of people struggling with substance use disorders or the patient or individual themselves is, I feel hopeless. Um, I feel helpless. I don't know what to do. I don't care about myself. I'm done. I'm over it. Um, something I hear quite frequently is, you know, people telling their friends is if I OD, don't hit me with Narcan. Um, I just want to die. And this thing we call substance use and mental health, um, can go to very dark places. Um, can go down the rabbit hole to where sometimes it doesn't look like it's possible to get out of it. Um, so what I would say to anyone that is struggling in that area or feels hopeless or helpless, um, you matter. Your story is important and you're here for a reason. And I mean, I'm living proof if I could go through all the hell that I've went through in my life and um, come out helping others, you can do it too. My name is Susan and I've been in recovery for seven and a half years. From, from a very young age, I, I was succumbed to, to sexual abuse and um, I always felt like there was something wrong with me. I, there was part of that abuse that, that was appealing to me at the same time and, and I knew that something inherently was bad about me and uh, I never really fit in with the other kids. I never had a place in this world and uh, something had to give and and finally i i just found that acceptance i i finally found my place when i found drugs and although it was chemical and it was fake it was the first time i ever felt whole in my life i started using drugs back in sixth grade when it seemed like the cool thing to do on the playground and um, i found a stash at my parents house and brought it to school and the first thing i remember was just being socially accepted I don't even remember getting high the first time. It was just a feeling of actually belonging somewhere when I never belonged my whole life. The first time that I drank, I chugged a whole beer by myself in the dark on my back porch. And uh, I remember not liking the taste, but I liked the way it made me feel. And the first time using marijuana, I just, I don't even remember getting high. I just remember the, the kids around me saying that I was cool. And that was exhilarating. Well, it started out just uh, using before school and stealing things and uh, progressed into every weekend, every day, started to get in the way of school. I was always an honor student and in the gifted program. And finally it caught up to me. I couldn't live a double life anymore. And so, I, I couldn't handle the drug use and going to school and I finally dropped out. My drug use put a wedge between me and my family. I never wanted to spend time with them. The only time I wanted to spend was with people that were getting high, people that were part of that lifestyle. And you know, as my drug use progressed, my father got, got sick with cancer and I was never around. The, his last year of his life, 
I didn't spend much time with him because I was too busy getting high. My dad was always the backbone of my family. And uh, watching him deteriorate was the hardest thing I've been through in my life. I've never seen a grown man just crumble in front of me like he did. I didn't know what to do. I was scared. I was lost. And I was completely eaten up by the disease of addiction. And any time I could see him, it just, it hurt too much. Like I would take his pills. I would take anything I could. And uh, I remember profoundly one day, my father collapsed in front of me and no one else was home. And I just looked at him on the ground as he vomited and he was in the fetal position and I had no idea what to do. When my father passed away, I remember part of me mourning and being scared and sad and upset and the same part of me was too concerned with what they were doing with his pills. I laid on the bed with my father's dead body and at the same time I was wondering like where they were and who was gonna get them before I had a chance. I remember shutting myself in the backyard in a shed in the middle of the summertime. And I was, I was up for days getting high. And I had myself barricaded in this room and I was naked and I was alone. And I looked over and there was a five gallon bucket that I was peeing in and there was a cockroach floating in it. And I just looked around me and I had this epiphany, like I wouldn't treat an animal that way. I've never, I've never seen a human being live in that, in that level of filth just to be treated so poorly and it was by my own design. And I knew I was going to die using. And I knew that was no way of life. But I couldn't stop. I tried going to detox quite a few times and every time I tried, I knew that I was just five days away from another relapse. Like I would get clean for a couple days and go right back to using again. There was no stopping. And the very last time was when I got arrested and I had no choice but to get clean. You know, the Department of Corrections really gave me that nudge that I needed. So it was hard at first, I didn't want to accept it, but a couple of weeks in, I knew that I needed to change something. And I just, I started praying. I started talking to my family differently. And I started to really like grab onto as much hope as I could. For some reason this time around, I thought I'd get better. I had to stop going around the places I was going, change all the people I knew. As soon as I got out of jail, I gave my mother my phone and I told her I couldn't have it anymore. I just, I had to get rid of every phone number I ever had, every connection I ever had. People would show up at my door and I'd tell them to go away or I'd call the cops. And that was the last thing you wanted to tell the people I was hanging out with, but I had to do anything I could to survive. And I was fighting for my life. I started going to meetings. I started hanging out with different people and, and talking about what was going on inside of me. There was so much pain and so much heartache that I carried with me and I had nothing to mask it anymore. And I had to just start opening up. It was the hardest thing I'd ever done, but it was the only thing I could do to make the pain go away. At first, when I first got into recovery, every day was just eating, <laughs> sleeping a lot. Um, I'd go to a meeting, I was just barely existing put on a lot of weight at the very beginning and um, it wasn't much of a life and finally I had to go, my probation officer made me get a job. So I started going to work, I started to be more productive. I started to learn how to live like a human because for years I lived at a sub subhuman level. I, I got a sponsor in a 12 step program and she told me to put as much effort into getting clean as I did into using. and. So I chased after my recovery and I would go to her house every morning. I'd have to get a ride there from my mother because I couldn't drive. And she'd take me on her way to work at like 6.30 in the morning. 
to this woman's house and I'd have to wait for her to wake up. And uh, I would go over to the neighbor's house who was also in recovery and help her with math and watch her kids. And, and she would talk to me about recovery and just spend time with me. And I remember the first time she had left me in her apartment, she had a ring on every finger and she left all of her rings on her desk. And I sat there looking at her desk and looking at all the rings. And I just remember being trusted for the first time. I still didn't have any trust for my family or anyone in my life. And this woman left all of her, all of her rings in front of me. And it made me feel like a human. Today, recovery is about just getting out of bed and facing whatever comes. I don't get to choose what my days are like sometimes. I don't get to choose what comes at me. And it's just rolling with the punches. Like I, I still have to talk about what's going on inside of me. I still have to confide in the people in my circle, but I just do the best that I can. And some days I just have to remember it's, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to not have it all together. You know, it's, it's okay to be in pain because I find those days when pain comes and anxiety hits me and the discomfort and, and I want to give in sometimes. You know, there's still part of me, I, I don't want to feel discomfort. I want to feel good all the time. That's part of my disease. And I just have to remember, it's, it's okay those feelings pass. Sobriety has given me complete freedom. I'm no longer enslaved to the disease of addiction or the lifestyle. I have dignity. I treat myself like a lady. Uh, there was a time in my life when I'd sell my body just for a hit. And I don't have to live like that anymore. My family has been more than supportive. I feel like it's more than I deserve sometimes. Because all of the pain that I cause and what seemed like irreparable damage, they've forgiven me. And that's, that's not granted. That's not something we just get for free. I lucked out. You know, I've I've faced people that I've harmed in this process and tried to make amends to them and just, you know, in response heard what a what a terrible person I am and I was met with anger and you know my family it hasn't been like that. It's been the hugest blessing to me because there were some relationships that I never thought I'd get back again. If someone's still struggling with addiction, I would tell them that they, they don't have to live like this anymore. There's a way out. There's hope. It doesn't matter what mistakes we've made. We can we can make good on them somehow, some way. Just try try not using for one day. You know, just focus on today and try not to use today, and then try again tomorrow. But we have to stay in the day. And, and just remember, like, it's no way to live. Um, in spite of all of my wrongdoings, my past, all the terrible mistakes I've made, I still have found a way to find success in my life. I've become employable. I've had a job for seven years, the same job. I've managed to make my way up in the hierarchy there. I've graduated from college three times. I've become a productive member of society and, and I keep going. I, I really enjoy doing art and, and being able to create things with my hands. I enjoy having a good laugh with my family and my friends and the people that love me. Me compared to nine years ago, just like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde two completely different people. I was bottom of the barrel at one point and, and today I wake up with self-worth. I wake up knowing that I'm a respectable woman. I know that I have value. I know that I'm important in this society and I know that people need me today. And I never felt like that before.
My name is Denny Kolsch. I am a licensed mental health counselor and a person in, in long-term recovery from heroin use. Would say that my drug use started through untreated anxiety and, and depression disorders. And I never really understood mental health or what I was struggling with through my teen years. And that started to develop into me uh, coping with those symptoms through drug use. And so it started off pretty um, more or less uh, mild to moderate in severity. And then it, it progressed as I graduated from Cocoa Beach High School into opioid use, uh, which started with painkillers, Oxycontin. Um, and that was in the early 2000s. And it went from that to heroin use. I would say ultimately it started with with not understanding mental health, not understanding what I was experiencing as a person and not having the right people around me that understood it either and could really intervene or knew how to intervene. So it started off what looked uh, like somewhat innocent and harmless or just like a basic struggle that most teens would go through and then uh, turned into a severe opioid use disorder. For me, my um, history of drug use started with with uh, some drinking, and that kind of primed things for um, me in high school experimenting other things and, and getting in that party mode. So from there, it really turned into um, steroid use. So when I was 16, 17 years old, I was exposed to steroids, and um, that was really a solution for me to deal with some of the inadequacies that I had as a high school student and wanting to be this image of a man or whatever society has concocted of, of what a, uh, a teenager, what a, a man should look like. So steroid use really set me up to experience some of my initial uh, symptoms of depression. And from there it turned into, okay, I have depression and I have anxiety. And so I need to cope with those things. So from there it turned into more alcohol use, but primarily using THC and um, using psychedelics. And from psychedelics, it turned into harder substances like cocaine. And then I landed on, on um, opioids, Oxycontin in the early 2000s, which was the time period that Oxycontin started hitting the streets in popularity. Um, in that initial, what we would call the first wave of the opioid crisis really started to emerge. So from Oxycontin, it then turned into heroin use and fentanyl use. After being sick several times from withdrawals, uh, withdrawal symptoms from heroin use, I, I, I would tend to come to these places of wanting change, but really not knowing what that looked like, not knowing how to attain that, and really um, being afraid of it ultimately, being afraid of going through the withdrawal process and, and having to do the work, whatever that looked like, of getting sober. So for me, I realized um, I didn't really have too many options left in terms of uh, in terms of what the future would look like using drugs. It didn't seem like there was really anything there for me ultimately, and I almost had a like a, a, a crossroads experience where I I saw very clearly that death was here, and on the other side was something other than death. And I didn't basically want to die. I had moments of it, but deep down I did want to live and I wanted something for my life. So that was the point where I made a decision with some people around me to, to choose life over the path I was on. I had a few people that were in my life, um, more like mentor figures that, that really motivated me to live a different life. So I saw the life that they were living. I saw the change that was happening in some of my friends' lives. And I knew that I didn't want to feel how I felt and I didn't want to live the life that I was living. So one of them was actually a uh, missionary and he was doing these medical missionary trips to Africa. And I was really blown away by by uh, who he was at this point compared to who he, who he was when he was using and it really inspired me to want something different. So what I've done with my life since is um, I, 
I mean, the first thing I did after I got sober was went back to school to become a mental health counselor, graduated, and then ended up several years later working in the addiction field. So at first I wanted to avoid being pigeonholed into the, the addiction therapist who used to be an addict. Um, so I only did mental health counseling, but then from there, I, I just felt called and uh, vocationally driven to do something in my community with my story. And so that turned into to me eventually starting Peace Club, which is um, a treatment center in Cocoa Beach. You know, jump on Facebook almost feels like every other week there's somebody that has overdosed, either died or almost did. It's uh, it's it's painful to see it. It's painful to experience it. And even potentially more sad, it's becoming like over the past years, becoming almost normal. When it happens, you almost think, oh, another person that I knew that I grew up with around here has died. Um, so that's what we're trying to change is that. So what I would say to someone who's, who's watching this and who is currently struggling with this or who is watching this and is struggling with the aftermath and the grief of losing somebody, I would say, hold on to hope, keep pressing forward, have good people around you, go to a, a support group, reach out to a therapist, like have people around you that can help show you the way and walk with you on that path to getting better because life can be better. And I've seen life be better for people who have um, experience the, the pain of death and loss, but also the people that have, have struggled themselves with an addiction and, and have started to lose hope. I've seen people like that, including myself, get better. Um, but it has to be done with, with people that can walk that path with you. My name is Craig Bettelotto. I'm a medical oncologist with Cancer Care Centers of Brevard and a team physician for VITAS Hospice here locally. I do believe that the overprescription of opioids has contributed to the opioid epidemic. The problem is that there are people out there who legitimately need opioids and, and my cancer patients are among them. The balance between providing narcotics for people who need them and, and the diversion and the abuse of narcotics leaves doesn't leave a lot of room for uh, patients to maneuver who really, really need it. So yes, I have uh, dealt with a loved one who uh, overdosed uh, from opioids. Uh, my ex-wife, uh, the mother of my three sons, uh, passed away from a multi-substance overdose about five years ago. The, the ripples from that event continue to uh, pulse through my family. Opioid abuse uh, can lead to opioid overdose, and especially when people are getting medications that they're not familiar with off of the street. They don't know the concentrations of it. They don't know what it's been adulterated with. But it is, but it is, you know, much more dangerous, I think, for people to go to the streets and get heroin, get uh, pills from some unknown source. Um, you know, when you come to a, a doctor and they're prescribing you medication. They know what they're doing. There's a better life for you on the other side, better relationships, better health, a better outlook, um, and uh, uh, a, better, uh, a better sense of yourself and a better sense of the world. Hi, my name is Stanley Briz. I am the Director of Community Services for Echo Connects, and I oversee Brevard County's Prevention Coalition. My training and experience with addiction came through my experiences with losing my best friend at the age of 25, and my younger brother being incarcerated right now and paralyzed from trying to acquire, illegally acquire, by stealing a medication from a pharmacy. I would tell the family of someone struggling with addiction that there's hope. It's never the end of the road and even beyond what you think might be the end of the road, which what would be death. You can still take that story and help so many other families not fall and into that same uh, feeling of hopelessness. I experienced that myself. My best friend died 
uh, from an overdose, a mixture of many things, including opioids. Uh, came from a very good family, came from a family that owned a small business, um, good looking guy, and had all the things that you would think would not lead someone to the path of trying to cope in a negative sense through substance misuse and abuse, but he did. And I would just tell people, uh, don't let the stigma and shame or the thought that, oh, it's not supposed to happen to my family, stop you from getting help, stop you from looking to help that individual um, or, or discourage you to make you believe that uh, there's something wrong with you or your family that can't be fixed or that can't be at least um, challenged and fought through. There's always help and, and it's never um, hopeless. There, there isn't an, an experience or a specific thing that motivated me to get into this field of work. I was already in this field when the most horrible things related to addiction that I, that I had ever been through happened to me. And that's uh, getting that call early in the morning that my best friend had died or, or getting that call the morning that um, I heard my brother had been shot by the police fleeing the scene of a crime of uh, trying to steal uh, pharmaceuticals from a pharmacy. And it, 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 I don't know, awakened me to a different and deeper understanding of what, what addiction and what, uh, even on the other side of, of selling uh, drugs was about. And it pushed me to a different level in my field, specifically looking at the younger population is we found that it's a lack of coping skills, not being taught or not understanding how to properly cope with whatever comes up in life. Uh, not all the time, but we've seen that in a lot of cases. And so that's when you get self-medication. A lot of times, of course, it's experimental. It may not always be uh, a trauma that you can point back to that started this happening. Uh, there's many, many different facets to it. Sometimes it's just you're with a group of friends and they're doing it and you don't want to feel left out. So what we're trying to do in my work daily is give them those tools to find healthy alternative coping mechanisms. And as I don't know, academic and brainy as that sounds, it's just really uh, teaching them the common things that we hope everyone gets. You know, how do you, what do you do when you have a bad day? What do you do when you feel left out? What do you do when you're feeling those deep feelings that adolescents experience all the time that they're always struggling with how to properly cope with. What do you do? What tools can I use within me to do that? It doesn't involve bringing in a substance to abuse. So some of the signs that I saw in my roommate um, should have been easy to point out, and some of them were. Um, for instance, I remember coming home one day and I was catching a cold and I said, man, I need to get some NyQuil. <laughs> uh, the, I use that some over the counter, counter medicine. I think I have some at home in my medicine cabinet. So I go to my medicine cabinet, pour some, and as soon as I taste it, I realize it's been watered down. That's strange. You know, I haven't used this in a bit. Why is it watered down? Come to find out he was diluting it um, and using it because, of course, I kept nothing in the house. I didn't even keep alcohol in the house because I did know from um, him and from his parents that he was struggling with addiction, but I didn't know how deep it was. Um, him dozing off uh, during religious services uh, and not just a normal, I'm tired, I work, but just the kind of dozing off where you can tell it's substance induced. Um, starting arguments with me and yeah, we had disagreements in the past, but I had known him for a long time. This was different. And if you've ever uh, experienced living or being close with someone who's battling addiction, it's interesting how their brain works. They're good at arguing and, and making logic fit where sometimes it doesn't fit, but it's still hard to um, hard to argue with them on it. And, and just the changes in personality. I remember finding him uh, parked outside where we were staying uh, with bottles in the vehicle. Just he had drank all night long when I thought, you know, he, uh, it's going to be coming home uh, on my way to work, finding him there. Just these behaviors that are definitely warning signs. Saw a lot of those things. Uh, the signs that I wish I had noticed and my brother that saw that, that there was a problem wasn't so much on the substance abuse line. Um, I had known about marijuana usage 
from my mom, but he was just kind of distant from me at that point. Not necessarily emotionally, more geographically, just not in my area in the same city, but never around and trying to reach out to him and, and make contact with him to be that older brother mentor. I really wish I had been more successful at that. Of course, like anybody else, you look back and say, man, would have, should have, could have, uh, did I try hard enough? Did I not? Um, remember getting calls from my mom, not knowing where he was, not knowing who he was with. And his situation was getting involved with someone who was more of a sophisticated criminal, who I believe was recruiting younger individuals. My brother was about 19, 20 at the time and um, being coaxed into trying to steal uh, medication that could be sold on the street. And my brother wasn't a troubled uh, kid. He had a decent life. He was the youngest, is the youngest. He's still alive. <laughs> Um, of the family, but unfortunately fell in with the wrong individuals and we weren't able to get to them in time is what I always say to prevent that. Um, and because of that, he's now uh, in a bad situation. He was left at the scene of that uh, crime. And as he came out of the drugstore, the police had already been called. The snipers were in place um, and seeing him fleeing with a flee with a gun seeing him flee with a gun, they shot first. And now he's paralyzed from the waist down, serving a 20 year sentence in prison. These are things that you don't think will happen in your own family, especially being in the field that I was in, but it shows you the universality of uh, what substance abuse, addiction, and then all the things that come with it, criminality, uh, the influence, the bad influences shows you what all comes with it and that no one is exempt from it. I have to deal with my, my mom being constantly concerned every day for his welfare, um, not knowing uh, from one day to the next how he's coping there, thinking about what could have been. Um, every day that I'm in uh, a store, like I don't know, even if I'm in a fast food restaurant, like and you see people working, going about their everyday lives that are about his age, thinking, ha, that could have been him. He could have taken a different path. Um, and thinking about my best friend, the things that he could have become. Um, he could have had a family, uh, children, could have done so much good for so many people because he had that to offer. But he was robbed of that opportunity because of addiction. Losing someone like that who understood you better than most people kind of takes from you a piece of, uh, of your mind, of your heart, of your soul, uh, when you have established roots with people. And uh, I remember that time and feeling a little more alone in the world. And so you have to live with that from, from day to day. Death through addiction can take things from us just like that. Um, and so when you have that mindset, the temporary time that we are here living on this earth, we can do the best that we can uh, to make it better for everyone else and try to encourage people towards hope. So my name is Dr. Tasha Browning and I'm a trauma therapist, a yoga teacher and a professor at Walden University. When you're working with someone who is battling addiction, it is a battle. And you don't send soldiers into war without being properly prepared for it. So before you reach out to um, help, you need to make sure that you are fully ready and engaged for that battle. Healthcare is getting more integrative. Um, it's, it's, it's a work in progress, but really, truly to tackle um, such a massive problem like addiction, you need um, multiple specialties. You need multiple professionals working together in team environments to tackle this issue. As a whole person, we are mind, we are body, we are spirit. And each of those areas need different professionals that have expertise to help you with that. There is no way um, to treat someone and really achieve full body wellness unless it comes from a uh, team environment and multiple professionals integrating what they know to be able to help someone. We do not always have control over what happens to us, but 
you can always rewrite your story. Like your story is not the story that's going to be with you for the rest of your life. You do have a say in how you want your life to be. And you also have a say in your happiness. And I think sometimes people forget that they have a say. So I would say the first step to getting help um, is actually stating that you have a problem. Um, coming to an understanding that you actually do have a problem and you do need help. But that requires us to be pretty honest with ourselves, and it requires us to be pretty brave in how we're willing to be vulnerable and to be exposed. And the only way that we receive help is by first uh, acknowledging that you need it. Thank you.